On va commencer la... On va reprendre les interventions. Un grand, on a un grand plaisir donc, euh, cette année donc, pour, la, pour la deuxième édition de, de la Fabelle Toulouse Conférence euh, d'avoir l'honneur de recevoir un Nick Gersenfeld. Donc, Nick Gersenfeld donc, est professeur au MIT. Euh, on s'est connu grâce à Odd Lipson qui n'est pas présent ici et qui, qui, euh, qui en 2008 m'a parlé des, des Fab Labs et qui m'a mis en contact avec, euh, avec Nils. Euh, donc Nils est donc le, le fondateur des, des Fab Labs, euh, il est physicien, mathématicien, euh, donc il a, les Fab Labs sont nés à peu près en 2000, you start the Fab Lab around 2000, and, euh, et, euh, donc il y a maintenant 150 Fab Labs dans le monde, donc Nils va vous, vous présenter l'ensemble des Fab Labs, l'ensemble aussi de, de ses recherches, donc je vais lui laisser donc, euh, la parole donc, pour, euh, pour, la, pour 45 minutes et après 15 minutes de, de questions. Quand vous voulez commencer, c'est bon. Merci. Je vais prendre le microphone de la Fab Labs. This meeting is all about Fab Labs. What is a Fab Lab? Uh, some of you I, I've known from the beginning, some I think are brand new. So what I want to do is talk through some of the history for people new to Fab Labs about what they are, and then talk through some of the present reality for some of the misconceptions, and talk about where all this is going. So this is advanced manufacturing, composite airplanes, IC, 3D printing, robots. But all of these date back to this. In 1952, MIT connected the first computer to a milling machine. Uh, it was an offshoot of using the first computers to make an air defense radar, which meant it had to respond in real time. And so Norbert Wiener and colleagues realized you could use it to control a machine. And it was used to make aircraft parts. And 3D printers, laser cutters, all descend from this. There is a computer controlling a head that moves around. Now, compare this process. This process has a bunch of really great features. One is you don't need a ruler to play with Lego. Coordinates come from the bricks. So the size of the Lego isn't limited by the size of the measurement system. Second is when you snap them, it's a constraint that reduces errors. So the tower side is more accurate than the motor control of the child. Um, in the 3D printing video, if you look carefully, you could see tangles when the 3D printer is printing and it doesn't adhere and then you start print on something that didn't adhere and you make a mess. Errors accumulate. Here, errors are reduced by assembly. Um, in the 3D printing, when you're done, you put it in the trash. Here, when you're done, you don't put it in the trash. You take it apart and use it again. So in all those ways, this is a better process. Now, that's not new. Um, that idea is four billion years old. Uh, this is the ribosome, the protein that makes proteins. And everything I just said is how it builds proteins. It builds in a fundamentally discrete digital way. And so the conclusion is you understand phones were analog. They got worse with distance. We now have the internet. You wouldn't use an analog telephone call to video conference with China. Um, Computers were analog. Vandenberg Bush made this at MIT. It's a room full of gears and pulleys. And the longer it ran, the worse the answer got. It got worse with time. Computers were digitized. You now carry effectively a supercomputer in your pocket. But laser cutting and 3D printing are analog. 
computers design it, but there's no information in the material. Where the research is heading is how to actually put the information into the materials. So programs just don't just describe things, the program actually are things. Now that may sound semantic, but think about the difference between an analog and a digital telephone call and an analog and a digital computer. So the real revolution coming in digital fabrication is not computers controlling tools. That happened in 1950. The revolution is coming is actually putting the computing, digitizing the materials themselves. So in this CBA program I run, we're tackling that in stages, from computers controlling machines to machines making machines, to putting codes into materials, and then putting programs into materials. So in stages, these are a bunch of rapid prototyping machines made with a Excuse me, the rapid prototyping machines. This one squirts, this is multi-axis machining, printing, large format, cutting, turning. Lots of different machines made with machines. Um, this was a fun one. This is another version of a folding rapid prototyping machine. It's both an NC mill and a 3D printer and a vinyl cutter that fits in a briefcase. Um, to do this, uh, we had to rewrite CAM for machine control. There's a lot of history in how that's evolved. We had to rewrite how a design gets to the machine. And more recently, I've showed some of you, we're so limited by the CAD side that we're now rewriting CAD um, for visual data flow programming that can talk directly to the machines. And if you're interested later, I can demonstrate and talk more about that. Um, then, in the machines I'm describing, rather than conventionally CAD, CAM, and machine control, since it's all being done in one operation, what you really want is the, the mathematical representation to actually talk directly to the machine. And so we're doing that by using a very interesting functional mathematical representation internally. And then that talks to a virtual machine in software. And then the physical machines are stateless. There's no file format. Instead, all the motors and actuators are just nodes on a real-time network. And so the virtual machine talking to the model data structure talks directly to the internals of the machine with nothing in between. And that's to make it easy to add or remove axes and change functions, things like that. So that's a bit about what's going on in machines that make machines. And then in the opposite direction for scanning, for, that's turning data into things, for turning things into data. Here's a fun example we did recently. Uh, we did an event with the uh, Transportation Security Administration, the people who bring you air airline checkpoints. And my students took a TSA padlock. They put it in our micro CT scanner, which is one of my favorite tools, but it costs about 10 fab labs. And, but it does um, micron resolution 3D scanning. Um, with it, they made a 3D model of the padlock, they worked out the master keys, and then they made them three different ways, with machining, 3D printing, and molding and casting, and showed the TSA administration how to reverse engineer their, their security system. So that's turning objects into data. So that's where we are right now. Of, um, first was computers controlling machines, we're right in the middle of machines making machines. And the thing, a theme you've heard through the meeting uh, is uh, the first generation of Fab Labs bought machines. As quickly as possible, the goal is to move towards machines made in the labs. So um, you, you buy motors um, and bearings, but the machines are made in the lab, and if you want a lab, you go to a lab. And we're part way there, and I'll talk some more about that. Within the next year or two, the goal is to remove machine vendors that have the machines made in the lab. Um, but that's still analog processes. So here's the next step in. Uh, these are a number of versions of discreetly assembled materials. This is for electronics. Instead of etching circuits, it, they're little tiny, think of micro Lego, that are, have electrical properties, conducting and insulating. And by how you place them in 3D, you assemble electronics. Um, this is a different version, which is the Lego here, instead of being tiny, are big carbon fiber composite parts. And by linking them together, it turns out you can make the world's lightest, strongest, highest performance material. So 
These are some examples of discreetly assembled materials. And we're doing over that, let's see, I'll come to the next part later. These are some of the machines we're developing to place those materials. And so this is what we see coming after 3D printing, where instead of printing, you're assembling. And what's so interesting about this stage is you can include heterogeneous materials like conductors or magnets in the process. Um, and when you're done, you can unbuild as well as build. You, you can disassemble and reuse the parts. And so this is where we see um, the successor to 3D printing coming to make complete functional systems in one machine. Now, there still is a machine. So a stage after that is putting programs into the materials. Uh, this is a workflow we developed to take a 3D design and turn it into a folding code so that the, uh, the code actually becomes the object, just like proteins do. But now this is a CAD way to design folding of geometry. And then we've implemented that in proteins, microfluidics, up to making big robots that work that way, to essentially make engineered proteins that can change shape. And so the most advanced version of this we're working on is uh, this. When you, you can now order custom DNA, and that's done with what's called solid phase synthesis, where you sequentially wash with the bases you're attaching to grow the DNA. Um, we're making a machine that instead of the bases A, G, C, T, attaches left or right folds. So you do solid phase synthesis, but to make geometry. And so the goal of this is to make a nano 3D printer where you grow the object from the molecules on up. So the molecules themselves are placing the materials to actually grow the object. And this is when we start to approach the Earl Grey hot, where we're actually coding the construction of the materials. And in a sense, there is no machine. The materials themselves are coding the construction. So that's the research roadmap we're following, where the words digital fabrication today means turning data into things, but where the research is going means actually turning data truly into things. The, the, the program becomes the thing itself. That's what the research looks like. To do the research, we put together all of these machines. We wrote a proposal to the NSF to say we wanted one of everything, and we got the NSF on a good day, and got one of everything. Then um, I had a problem. It would take a lifetime of classes at MIT to be exposed to all those processes. So we had all these machines, but we needed to teach people to use them. And so modestly, I started a class called How to Make Almost Anything. And that was aimed at a few research students to learn to use the machines and was completely unprepared for hundreds of students begging to take the class. Uh, you know, and then they'd say, this seems too useful. Can you teach it at MIT? Uh, and then the surprise was what they did. They weren't there for research. They were just there because they wanted to make stuff. And they did semester projects. So they learned to use all the machines, just all these skills. And uh, Kelly was a sculptor. Uh, her semester project was a device that saves up screens, records them, and plays it back later when it's convenient. Uh, um, this was a web browser for parrots. Parrots go have the cognitive ability of a young child. They go crazy left home alone. It lets parrots talk to the, you know, browse the internet, talk to um, other parrots. Um, this was an alarm clock you wrestle with and convince the alarm clock that you're awake. Um, this was a dress instrumented with sensors and spines, and it would protect your personal space if somebody got too close. And each year, year after year, people did these projects in this class that was supposed to be for research students on machine building. And I finally got this parallel. Uh, this is Ken Olson, the head of Digital Equipment Corporation. <coughs> MIT made the first transistorized, sort of large-scale transistorized computer called the TX series that was commercialized as PDPs in this company, DEC, 
And Ken Olson famously said, there's no reason to have a computer in the home. The, the quote is slightly out of context. If you want, I can tell you the full context, but roughly it means what it, it sounds. Um, DEC is twice over bankrupt. Uh, they were bought by Compaq, Compaq was bought by HP, and of course you have a computer at home. But the point is, it's not there for inventory and payroll. It's there to talk to friends, to listen to music, to do the things that make you, you. And so in the same sense, the students in the class were answering what I hadn't asked. We were doing research on digitizing fabrication, but we weren't asking, so what? And they were showing the answer is the killer app like computing of digital fabrication is personal fabrication. And the point of having personal fabrication in the home isn't to make what you can buy in the store. It's to make what you can't buy in the store. It's not to make mass market uh, teacups. It's to make teacups that reflect uh, what you want. And it's, it's precisely the story of computing. So you can trace this parallel history. There are mainframes, then mini computers, then hobbyist computers, then PCs. If, uh, on this side, we have the machine tools of fabrication, like I have at MIT. The mini computers are like the fab labs. The hobbyist computers are like these machines that make machines. And the PC is like the Star Trek replicator. Now, there's a lot of implications of this parallel. Uh, the replicator doesn't yet exist. In Star Trek, it was Earl Grey hot, not a messy piece of plastic. 3D printers make a piece of plastic. The, the, the replicator has to make complete functional systems down to the finest detail. And that's many years of research to come. Uh, if you look at the PDP, uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is. Uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs, and they're in the process of inventing Unix, the modern operating system that underlies um, uh, modern computing. Uh, at this point, a computer wasn't really what you think of as a computer. Uh, if you look here, there's a rack for processing and a rack for storage and a rack for communications, all these separate things you have to plug into each other. It was certainly not easy to use. Uh, but the cost at, was about $100,000 and it filled a room, which means a work group could have one rather than a whole corporation. And so two guys could invent Unix. In the same sense, the Fab Lab is pretty much exactly the same. When we started with it, it's about 100K, it fills a room. It's a bunch of different stuff, but if you connect them all up, you can sort of emulate what this would do. Then in this stage, this is the out there. This was a life-changing machine for people like me. And when it first came out, the, this was the first computer you could buy for yourself, uh, around $1,000. Uh, when it first came out, the killer application was you would flip the switches on the panel to load a program, and then you'd watch the binary lights blink as your program ran. And that was it. It was life-changing. Uh, the point is, th this was not yet useful, but it was personal and inspired a generation. And it's very similar to these emerging machines. These machines can't yet do what these machines do, um, but they're very empowering. And then they're on the way down to this. Now, the lesson to draw from this is just about every single thing you do on a computer today, uh, email, word processing, video games, uh, happened here. It didn't happen up there because you can't play with them. But by the time you got down here, it was already done. The mini computer era is when the internet was invented. E everything about the technology changed. It got faster, better, cheaper. But the applications came here. So in the same sense, the Fab Lab is not at all the final form of the technology but it emulates what it can do, and it means you don't need to wait 20 years. We're at a moment now that's like the invention of the internet, and we don't need to wait 20 years for the research to be finished to do it. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we don't really 
struggle to make lots of tiny changes to follow technical progress in the fab lab. The PDPs went through a bunch of generations, but the reality is everything we're using is going to go away as the technology evolves. The real point in this stage is inventing the applications and the systems around it. So where Fab Labs then came from is there was a clear research lesson, fabrication is being digitized. There was a clear conclusion that the killer app is personalization. And then there was this overwhelming demand from the class I was teaching at MIT. So around then, uh, the US Congress passed legislation that said uh, government agencies have to measure outcomes. You can't just spend money. And so um, NSF turned around to us and said, do social outreach. Um, they, NSF had no idea how to do that. But they turned around and asked us. And of course, we had no idea how to do that. We were just buying expensive machines to do this stuff. Uh, but we had adventurous program managers, and so we made a deal with them. Uh, rather than make a website or teach a class, we thought the machines were more interesting than the stories. So we said, yeah, what if we went into a community center and we set up the greatest hits? So the tools in my lab are maybe $10 million, but out of that we limited it down to about this 100K set of the most used stuff and put together some software and materials and set one up at a community center in Boston. And that was the extent of our vision. That was the whole project. Um, it was fun to do, but it was also just to shut up the NSF and make them go away. And then what we didn't expect was um, they started doubling. So uh, this is in rural India, in the western part of Maharashtra. There was a strong Ghanaian connection. Uh, and this is in Sakandi Takarati in the coast of Ghana. This is Soshin Gobi outside Pretoria in a South African township. This is Jalalabad in eastern Afghanistan. Um, you can't wake up in Cambridge, Mass and decide uh, rural Afghanistan needs precision fab, but every time we opened one of these labs, somebody else uh, wanted one. And so there's now about 150 labs. They're doubling about every year and a half. Uh, they're connected by a very lightweight set of sense of rights and responsibilities around the transparency in the labs and an evolving set of core capabilities. Initially, I thought, wait, we're not done. Give us 20 years to finish the research. But instead, what's happening is the PDP continuously evolved into the PC and the fab labs are continuously evolving technologically as it advances. So, in the standard fab labs we've been setting up, there's about 50K in equipment, 20K in materials, um, custom software, some site prep, so a large format mill. I'll show some applications, a precision mill, a laser cutter, 3D printer, scanner, knife cutting, molding, casting, soft tooling, embedded programming, electronics. Um, so all that stuff. This is sort of a subset of the big lab, and all of this is what's going to get smushed together into the final lab. Now, there's a, one misconception is Fab Labs mean 3D printers. Of all the machines, that's my least favorite one. Um, it takes a long time, it has mediocre material properties. There are some things for which it's best for complex geometry, but it's a little bit like in the 1950s when microwave ovens come out, came out, you know, telling chefs the future of cooking is the microwave. And you, know, you have a microwave in the kitchen but it doesn't replace the rest of the kitchen. So these are some fat processes. These are pictures from the students in my How to Make Anything class at MIT. Um, one of my favorite processes that we can do in the class and in the fab labs is molding and casting, soft tooling. So in each of these, you machine machinable wax, you cast an elastomer, and in that you then cast materials. And that process takes about the same time as 3D printing, but has much better surface finish. It has much better structural properties. You can work with a much wider range of materials. And when you're done, you can do production modes. So in every way, this is a better process other than if you have a really complex geometry. But for example, um, 
That's a hypercube that was made out of a seven-part mold. You can make really complex geometries by nesting. So soft tooling and molding casting is one of the best processes for 3D rapid prototyping. Uh, by orders of magnitude, the laser cutter is the most used tools. Here's a laser cut, snap together, boom box. Um, there's a computer-controlled knife that's really versatile. Here's gorgeous, expressive paper structures. Um, the large format tools let you make things that you cannot remotely make with a 3D printer. This is um, a mono-wheel bike a uh, student made in the class. Um, then there's precision machining for electronics. Another misconception is in a fab lab you can use an Arduino. The real point here is not that you can use an Arduino, you can make an Arduino. And then in turn by making an Arduino, you can get to know the processors and then you can design a range of things with the processors. Um, and we're now rolling out um, uh, tooling for uh, making composites. This was, uh, um, somebody bought a new Mac and wanted a hard shell case, and so did vacuum bagging with composites. And in fact, for the fiber, he used old uh, denim jeans, which have great structural properties. So these are the, some of the processes used in fab labs, the range of capabilities. To understand it, and picking up from Bart's talk, to think about it in powers of 10, For $100, you can make a machine. This is uh, David uh, Carr's Mantis, which was, he set out to make the cheapest possible NC mill. It works, but it doesn't work that well. Uh, for about 1K, you can make a nice machine. This is Jonathan's MTM Snap to make the soft tooling for molds and the circuit boards. There are a number of machines like this in about the 1K range. Um, one of these is not yet a whole lab. Um, you know, just rounding, uh, ten, of, 10 of these add up to a complete lab, meaning you, you'd like an additive process and a subtractor process it and a number of workflows, but you add up a bunch of these to build um, a lab. Then in the commercial, the fab labs we've been deploying currently, in, think of that as 10, 10K machines, where now these, the machines themselves cost about 10K. But in return for that, um, uh, you can get large formats like the ShopBot. And one of the useful things at this stage you get is just the supply chain, that we can push go and have 100 of these deployed, where these don't yet, it's coming, but don't have the supply chain. And so to think about the relationship, um, you can use the machines at this scale to make this scale. And then in turn, one of my machines back on campus cost as much as a whole fab lab. And you use that not just to make the machine, but to do the research on the processes. And so what I've been seeing is not that the cost goes down steadily, but each of these is interesting. This is something one person can do. This is a small but complete lab. This lets you not just use machines, but make machines. And there's always going to be a, a larger scale like that in this recursion to create the tools and then these research facilities. And so. Um, what's called a fab lab canonically is here. What's emerging is this kind of nice flow through this hierarchy of capabilities. So we started setting these up, and um, we didn't have an agenda, but what started to emerge was a flow from just empowerment. These were young girls doing rapid prototyping on a street corner in Boston, you know, making money, having fun, discovering technology is cool. Then the kind of education that was happening in the class at MIT, this was a young girl in Ghana who right after we set up the lab there wouldn't leave until she could make a surface mount circuit board on her first day in the lab. I didn't do that until I got to MIT, so she's really skipping over how I did my education. And then the labs weren't meant to be useful, but they started doing a useful project. So it, here's a tour through um, some of the labs. Uh, Alex is here from the Vogue. In the middle of Amsterdam, maybe the most interesting building had been derelict for decades. This was the old customs house. And so they colonized it, they set up this wonderful lab and did a very important project for Amsterdam, which is to make a foosball table. Um, but Alex could design the table, um, he could design the characters. Using the soft tooling process I mentioned, he could insert, mold them, uh, make the electronics. Um, you could play Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> Um, 
it, I, I've heard either that's me or that's a, a, a Roman legion. I'm not. It's not me. Oh, okay, good. So um, uh, David could play Darth Vader in foosball. Uh, um, th there's a wonderful new lab just opening in Toulouse with uh, Nicolas Macaulay. And And this lab has something no other fab lab has, which is this warehouse. <laughs> they get to make really big things. Um, this is one of my favorite labs. This is Haystack in Maine. This is an arts colony. And the US um, Institute of Architects has a list of the greatest buildings. And one of the greatest buildings are these cabins in the Maine woods. Rustic cabins, but exquisitely tumbling down to the ocean. And this is where people who do, like, the greatest printmakers and glass blowers and blacksmiths retreat to the woods to do traditional crafts. So two years ago, we set up a fab lab there. Half of the artists were up in arms. They were horrified, saying, what's this technology doing here? We do craft. The other half were horrified at them, saying, ink, paper, metal, that's technology. Um, this is technology. And a year later, it. Uh, people fight over access to the tools. Um, an artist was struck by the light on the main ocean, so we helped them uh, turn the picture into a 3D scan that we milled in foam to cast concrete to slump glass so the glass sparkles like the main ocean. Or we helped with quick turn prototyping of intaglio um, printing plates by precision machining. Oh. Or using the composite process made of boat. Uh, this is a lab uh, with, uh, in Tulsa working with Spirit Aerosystems, one of Airbus suppliers and Boeing's former factories. Uh, one of their biggest problems is they can hire people with degrees, but they don't know how to do stuff. And so they were very interested in a community lab to help find people and teach them skills to actually solve problems. And so uh, a project out of there, among others, is developing uh, UAVs you can make in the lab. This is a lab in Detroit, uh, and this one is funded by juvenile delinquents in teenage pregnancy. Um, it, it takes at-risk youth in the juvenile justice system, brings them into the lab, where they have fun, learn skills, discover science and technology are interesting, and engage with the people around them and have better outcomes than, than the social services that we're on offer. And it's really running, among other functions, as a social service in the community. Uh, this is a lab in Manchester. Uh, Manchester used to have three quarters of the world's mills. They're all gone. They have two football teams and not much else. And so they're working on kind of a new industrial revolution where you, you go to market by shipping data. Because something you can make in any of these labs, you can produce in all of them and sell around the world. Um, this is a lab in Afghanistan. And one of the projects there was making uh, internet access, so making antennas and radios. And then the lab would have local copies of OpenCourseWare and Wikipedia and things like that. And uh, deploying this, led to wild stories, like when they started setting it up, a village would say, we get that or we kill you. <laughs> and the people in the lab would say, okay, we'll make some antennas for you. <laughs> and then another village would say, no, we get it or we kill you. And they would say, okay, we'll make some antennas for you. And it, it, it sort of completely changed the dynamics to go from fighting over a scarce resource to being able to produce it locally. And then, without any fuss, they were serving all this internet content, and people would look at that and say, oh, I didn't realize the world was like that. It really had a tremendous infectious impact. And now that project, which has a long history, it started at the lab in Boston. Uh, it was debugged in the field at the lab in Norway. It was first used in the field in South Africa. The first large-scale deployment was in Afghanistan. Now it's running on a commercial basis in Kenya for user-created citywide internet uh, we have in the lab. Uh, Tomas is here from Barcelona. For the last European solar decathlon, they did a great rapid prototyping project where 
uh, come out of the lab, they developed a complete solar house. So starting with how you make a playhouse, but doing that at scale. So the, this you know, gorgeous house, including all the furniture in it. And what was very funny was that the, the Catalan, there were nine rectangular boxes, and then this one beautiful flowing one. Uh, they got the first place in the People's Choice, and they got the last place for performance, but that was because everybody liked this better and wanted to be in this one. <laughs> So the amusing thing that followed that was they now run the city. Uh, Vicente, who created this lab, <coughs> is the city planner, the city architect. His buddy, uh, Tony, is the deputy mayor, and their buddy is the mayor. And the connection is, in Spain, in Barcelona, there's 50% youth unemployment. This appalling number. Half a generation doesn't have a chance to get a job and leave home. Yet, ships come to the harbor with products made in China and end up in trash dumps. And so the goal of this project is for the city to be globally connected for knowledge, but self-sufficiently locally for what it consumes. And so as part of the civic planning, they're deploying fab labs through the city as part of the city's infrastructure. Um, there are a couple labs into that. Tomas can tell you more about that project. But viewing this as part of the infrastructure of the city. Um, this piece just came out, and I talk about these emerging policy implications. Uh, this was a fab lab we had at the World Economic Forum for heads of state and CEOs who were all depressed because nothing they did worked. But the kind of grassroots activists were they were really excited because of how the technology was empowering people. Um, this is a lab opening. It's in a very mixed neighborhood in Washington, D.C., but at the end of the street is the Capitol building. Uh, and projects like this, this is President Obama visiting a lab, led to this very interesting legislation to turn the Fab Lab uh, network into a national lab. National labs in the US, like many countries, are these billion dollar facilities. Uh, but they have a mission of not just basic science, but also impacting the communities around them that they're not very good at. And so the idea is to view the whole lab network itself as a national lab made out of connected local labs, like what Barcelona is doing, but now on a national scale. So then as this community has grown, uh, it's been meeting. There's a cycle of meetings that uh, went from Boston to Norway. Uh, this was in South Africa. At this meeting, as an experiment, uh, I brought some of the pioneers in digital fabrication. Charlie Bennett invented essentially quantum computing. Uh, Eric Winfrey invented DNA origami, making smiling faces out of proteins. And then um, these are inventors from the Sochin Govi lab. Um, uh, Tebo interfaced his cell phone to his lights for safety. Rodney made robot vacuum cleaners. And what was wonderful is like coming on them, nobody's doing outreach to anybody. They're just peers talking shop, which are equals in this new world of digital fab. Uh, it went to Chicago, uh, India. Um, Amsterdam, Lima, it was just in uh, New Zealand, it'll be in Japan next year, and then Barcelona the year after that. So to keep up with that, this is much bigger than an outreach project. And so spinning off are a set of regional foundations to provide operational support. And the French one was just launched uh, a day ago. Um, Funds to invest in businesses where you can create business platforms, where you ship data, you go to market by shipping data, not by shipping products. An emerging um, user group to connect the user and an educational program. And then in the background is the research. Um, remember, the fab labs, as, as you know them, aren't the end state. These are the mini computer state. And we're continuing to drive the research roadmap towards the stages I showed you. And so, of these, I want to talk about the educational piece that, in many ways, I think is the most important. Uh, this is Hans Christian. He, uh, he was a young boy at Hawkins Lab, which is um, it's as far north as you can go in Norway. It's a few hours above the Arctic Circle. So at that lab, the satellite dishes look at the ground, not the sky, because that's the weight of the satellites. 
And in the local school in Ling Sidek, he was kind of considered a problem because he had learned everything they could teach him and didn't have much to do. So I showed him some demonstration projects, and the next time I saw him, he made this complete robot truck. He designed the body, the, uh, the circuit board, the motor controller, the 3D design of the body, the windshield was an LCD. Um, this was Chapiso, who I didn't realize, she's at the lab in, in South Africa and so Shingovi, was using it to do the work of projects in my class from a distance. And so uh, kids like this were falling off a cliff. They were so far ahead of local educational opportunities. Uh, the only answer was, you're smart, you have to leave now, you have to go far away. And so that led to this Fab Academy project to provide an educational career path. And the idea is instead of sending them far away, students have peers with mentors in work groups with tools in labs. And then they're linked by global video lectures and online content to make a fundamentally distributed um, educational platform. Uh, Early on, I went to EduCause, that runs .edu, to turn this into a .edu. They said, we love it, where are you located? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, we, well, we can't help you because accreditation, which you need to become a .edu, by law is geographical. You accredit uh, where you're standing. There's no notion of accrediting a network. So they encouraged us to pretend uh, to make up a degree given in a global network, and then let the accreditation process catch up to it. And that's what we're doing. There's a skills-based accreditation that's justified by the skills they learn um, in this network. Uh, you, you can sort of think of it this way. MIT is very much like a mainframe. You, you go to MIT for processing, and it runs a small number of batch jobs. Uh, distance learning that gets a lot of attention is like time sharing. The student is like a terminal connected to the mainframe. Um, you can think about the Fab Academy as an internet. It's sort of an internet of education where there's nodes in a network where any one node isn't self-sufficient but the network of them is and it's a distributed model that's very, very different from the distance learning model. That I think the opportunity here is MIT can fit a few thousand people. The planet has a few billion people. So that, that's off uh, by six orders of magnitude. Um, this network can tap a much greater fraction of the planet's brain power by bringing advanced technical education um, and business incubation and all of that, not in isolation, but distributed in the networks to tap more of the planet's brain power. Uh, so a way to understand the trajectory is uh, this is Seymour Papert. And in a funny way, you can trace modern computing to him because he studied with Piaget and was struck by how children start life as scientists. You do experiments to learn, and it's slowly strangled out of you. And he came to MIT to use those first computers, uh, that what became the PDPs. And he had this idea, what if kids could use a computer? Which is, at, at that time, they were only for big corporations in the military, as a bigger sandbox to learn with. And so they invented a turtle, which is, how does a kid use a computer? So out of the picture here is the room-filling PD, room PDP. But there were buttons in this turtle so the kids could program it. And that was the first use of kids playing with a computer. Uh, this project inspired Alan Kay, who worked with Seymour, then went to Xerox, and at Xerox invented, roughly with some other people, windows and mice. And he wasn't aiming it at business executives, he was aiming it at this idea of play with the computer, discovery. It was for kids, not, not for business. And then from there, of course, you know that history. But meanwhile, um, Seymour's protege, Mitch Resnick, developed uh, Lego Mindstorms, which was, instead of connecting the, this to a computer, you put the computer in it. But then when the, this viral spread of Fab Labs happened, I, I didn't think it was connected to anything. But Seymour said, he described it as a thorn in his side 
that he didn't want the kids to program the turtle's motion, he wanted the kids to make the turtle. For him, that was the point. And so he saw Fab Labs not as an aberration, but precisely exactly lined up to that history. If you start from um, turtles and then Lego logo and sort of that whole evolution of computing, the notion that you get to express yourself in the technology is where it was aiming at from the beginning. And so viewed one way, this was from research on digital fabrication, but viewed another way, it, it's a fulfillment of the history of, of this genesis of computing. So there's background in all of these things. Um, stepping back, Fab Labs, if you follow that history, are a snapshot. It's technology is moving. The goal as quickly as possible is first to remove the vendors so labs make labs, then to remove the trash by using digital rather than analog materials, then remove the machines by using programmable materials. So that's many years of research to come in this roadmap technically. But what you're all doing is the equivalent of the invention of the internet. Once we do everything I just said, the applications will still be the same. You can go to any of these fab labs and do what you'll be able to do. Today you have to buy the microcontroller. When we're done you can make it. But you don't have to wait then. And so how you live, work, play, learn, when anybody can make anything, changes everything. I thought the technology was hard, that's humming along. What we found is hard is in just about every single direction we need to invent new organizations. And so the project is what's the new organizational capacity to match the technology. And in doing that, nobody's an expert. The incumbents generally aren't useful. Schools aren't global scalable network. Aid doesn't do technology. Each of these crosses boundary. And so the hard part is inventing that organizational capacity, and that's, that's both the opportunity and that's the challenge that needs the network. So with that, I'll thank you and take questions. Talk here. Um, I have a question. You showed a picture of uh, the turtle, uh, tortoise, turtle of uh, Seymour. Actually, this picture is coming from the work of a woman called uh, Radia Perlman that you might know very well. She's a great uh, computer scientist, and she was working on the device on the left, which is some kind of a tangible remote controller for the turtle. Yeah. And uh, uh, this person is a very famous computer scientist, and she was working with Seymour at the time. Uh, in the goal of helping children to understand something very complex uh, without making it too simple. So it's also your goal, I think, to... Uh, you're not translating uh, something complex into something for children. You, are, you try to transfer to children a uh, good enough environment so they can make sense at their level, maybe, but of something that is complex and prepare a new generation. So in the same idea, how would you think you could do today to involve people that are great scientists to help in the process and to assist the people that uh, are crowdsourcing now this big initiative, like to, to basically involve uh, Nobel Prize people building the web and not just people with web pages. So the, the answer to that is the big project for me I see coming next. Okay. Um, so in the day job at MIT, the big job is the replicator. And to, to sort of to take that as a given. Well, lots of research to come, roadmap, tools, machines, money, we don't, we'll, we'll make that. Um, in the, so I, I want to be clear, nobody runs the fab lab network. I certainly don't. Nobody is in charge. This is laterally aligned. And there's a wide range of questions about 
sustainability and social impact and things like that, of which I'm the worst person possibly to, to answer them. A number of people here are much better than me. But within that whole cloud, something that I care deeply about is the emergence of the Stab Academy. And so to answer your question in two stages, these amazing kids falling off a cliff who now are bringing through this process are learning skills way ahead of local educational opportunity. And one of the interesting things that emerging just at that stage is we have this made up degree, Fab Diploma, but it's skills based where they show mastery of all these principles of digital fabrication. And now, for example, we're in discussion with a number of companies on hiring the stars that come from this program, completely outside of any traditional schooling and completely geographically outside of normal recruiting, but skills based. So a kid in an Arctic village or an African village gets hired by an advanced aerospace company based on their skills. And there's a lot of interest in that because in many ways for investors and entrepreneurs or companies hiring, they find degrees don't mean skills, they need people can 